so far we've learned that Judaism is the spiritual path of the Jewish people. And we've learned that the Jewish people were chosen by God to be a light and a blessing to the rest of the world. That's essentially why we're here. And we learned that the teachings of Judaism are contained in the Torah and in our spiritual literature. And their essential goals of this literature are to help us as individuals and as a nation, as a people, to reach our potential. Some people have observed that all of these teachings are really centered in three areas. One is the relationship between individuals and God, the, the divine human relationship. The second area is the relationship between people and themselves. We and our soul and trying to really come to the fulfillment of who we can be as individuals. And thirdly, the relationship between people to one another, the interpersonal realm. The Torah focuses directly, primarily on two of these. You'll find a tremendous amount in the Torah dealing with the relationship between people and God, and that is captured by the famous directive which teaches us v'ahavta es Hashem alokecha you shall love the Lord your God it's one of the great teachings of the Bible is that human beings are here to have a love relationship with God and the second of these three areas is captured by the famous teaching of the Bible v'ahavta l'reyecha kamocha you shall love your neighbor or your friend as yourself <coughs> One of the highest goals in Judaism is what we call, what the Bible calls, devekut. Devekut literally means attachment. And the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to attach ourselves to God. We're supposed to become intimately connected with God. And the word itself, devekut, is a very, very powerful term for the Bible to use because in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, where the Bible speaks about the creation of human beings, and it says, therefore, each man must leave his father and mother and attach himself to his wife. Vidavak ba'ishto. That same word that the Bible uses for the connection, intimate connection between a man and a woman, is the very same word, devekut, that the Bible uses for the divine human connection. But how do we achieve this? How do human beings attach themselves to God. So the truth is, Judaism and the Bible offer many ways in which we're able to do this, but one of the primary ways in which we attach ourselves to God is, as the Torah itself describes in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9, the halachta bedrachav. We're supposed to walk in the ways of God. What in Latin is described as imitatio dei, imitating God, modeling ourselves after the way God is shown to act in the Bible. So the Talmud says, for example, just as God is merciful, we are to be merciful. As God is generous, we are to be generous. As God is compassionate, we are to be compassionate. And the idea is that when we begin to model ourselves after the way God behaves, we become like God. And it's a way of attaching ourselves to God. By the way, human psychology has very, very uh, clearly demonstrated the power of this idea that people build closeness by becoming like each other. They found, for example, that people that have tremendous rapport and have a tremendously close relationship, if you watch them interacting, they tend to act as a mirror one towards the other. There's a wonderful teaching by Yitzchak Buxbaum in, these, in this regard. He says, if you look in the Bible at the creation story, so he describes the creation of man as different than everything else that was created. The creation of the human being has God taking earth and 
forming the earth into the shape of a human being. And he says that if you look at this activity, if you look at what God is doing, there seems to be an analog to something else that happens in the Bible. If you look at what God is doing in this scene, it looks very much like something that human beings do. God takes earth, takes dirt, takes the stuff from the ground, and he molds it into a shape. And that shape is called something B'Tselem, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. Buxbaum says, think about what we do as human beings when we try to create or build an idol. So we might take clay and we might form it into the shape of what we imagine to be a god. And the Hebrew word for an idol is tselem. So he says it's interesting that the action of God in creating a human being is taking earth, taking clay, taking dirt, and forming it into a human shape. And that human is called in the Bible, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. And yet we do something that's sort of similar. When we try to create God, so to speak, we take earth, we take clay, and we shape it into what we imagine to be the image of God. And that idol in Hebrew is also called Etzelem. And Buxbaum says that what the Bible is teaching us here is a very important lesson. The Bible is teaching us that if we want to serve God, if we want to get close to God, we shouldn't serve what we make to be in the image of God. We should serve what God made in his own image. When we serve what we make, what we think is the image of God, that's called idolatry. But when we serve other human beings, which is what God made in his image, that is what the Bible is saying is the path toward getting close to God. We ultimately are able to serve God by serving that which he made in his image, by helping people, by being in service of these people. So one of the things I want you to think about tonight is that these ideas of loving God and loving man are very much connected, interrelated, and they really reflect back on each other. So here we have an idea that we are able to serve God ultimately by connecting ourselves and helping and serving other people. We get to God, so to speak, through other people. But the truth is it goes the other way as well. The truth is that our ability to relate to others, our ability to serve others, really depends on our connection with God. Let me share with you a few examples. In the book of Genesis, Abraham has his wife kidnapped by Avimelech. And when he protests and says, what, what are you taking my wife for? Avimelech says, well, I, I thought it was your sister. I didn't realize it was your wife. And Abraham is questioned. Abraham is questioned, why did you lie to me? Avimelech wants to know, you deceived me. You told me it was your sister. Why didn't you just tell me she was your wife? And Abraham says to him, it's because there's no fear of God in this place. And he says, if there's no fear of God in this place, you would kill me to get my wife. What Abraham is basically saying is, look, you might be a nice guy, Avimelech. You might be very moral. You might be someone that's respected in your community. You may have your values and your ideals and your ethics. But push comes to shove. What's really stopping you from killing me in order to take my wife if she is what you really want? There's nothing holding you back because you don't have a fear of God. Your entire 
ethical system is based upon what you feel to be right and wrong. So even though you may normally think it's wrong to take someone else's wife, but if you have a conflict, if it's someone that you really want, what's holding you back? You are the judge, jury, and executioner. And so since you don't fear God, there's nothing to stop you from killing me and taking my wife. Bertrand Russell was a famous atheist who did not believe in God, but he came to realize that without a divine being that establishes ultimate absolute morality, there really is no morality. And he said it in a very, very pithy way. Bertrand Russell said, I fail to believe, I refuse to believe, he said, I refuse to believe that the only thing wrong with wanton cruelty is that I don't like it. Now, what he meant was, you have to sort of read through what he's saying. He is saying that since he doesn't believe in a God, so at the end of the day for Bertrand Russell, what's wrong with stealing or murder or rape? What's wrong with it? So he understands there's either one or two things wrong with it. Either it's wrong because the state says that it's wrong. Society says that it's wrong. But he realizes that's very, very weak because what if society changed its rules? So let's say you're in a society where they say, you know what, it's permissible to steal from people who are blonde. That's the new law. Bertrand Russell understood that that cannot make something right simply because the society, the government, declares that it's right or it's wrong. So he, was re he had to resort to, well, then it offends me. Stealing bothers me. It, 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 it offends me. Rape bothers me. It offends me. Murder bothers me. But he couldn't appeal to anything greater. And he said, though, I refuse to believe that the only thing wrong with wanton cruelty is that I don't like it. He had a realization that there must be something more to what makes it wrong than the fact it offends him. He felt there must be something intrinsically wrong with murder, cosmically wrong with stealing. But he couldn't appeal to anything intrinsic or cosmically wrong with it. All he had were his sensitivities, his sensibilities, his feelings. Maimonides explains, I think, if we read into him, a little bit about why ethics and morality have to be based upon revelation. Maimonides says that the truth is, human beings, when we came off the assembly line, we were perfectly capable of knowing right from wrong. Because Maimonides says that before human beings in the Garden of Eden ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, before we ate from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, Maimonides said that we didn't see things, human beings didn't see things in categories of good and bad or right and wrong. He suggests that human beings saw everything in categories of true or false. That was the way we saw everything. Now, we understand when it comes to issues of mathematics, 2 plus 2 is 4, true. 2 plus 2 is 9, false. So we see an issue like mathematical equations as true or false. But if you or I are walking down the street and we see some 40-year-old man chasing a 9-year-old child with a big knife and the child is running away terrified, we might stop this person and say, stop, what you're about to do is wrong. It's evil. And Maimonides says that's not what Adam and Eve would have said before they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They would have said what you're about to do is false. Because he says that originally human beings had a crystal clear perception of everything in the world, be it a mathematical equation or an ethical equation. He said, what was the effect of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? He said, now our way of, of processing and interacting with the world was no longer in categories of true and false. It now became categories of right and wrong, good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil, right and wrong, are not as objective as true or false. When we speak about categories of right and wrong, good and evil, those become somewhat subjective. And what's the proof? Take any moral, ethical issue in the world today 
and get a room full of people, a hundred people or a thousand people, intelligent people, sensitive people, bright people, and ask them to weigh in on a question like abortion. And you will get bright, sensitive, intelligent people that differ on that question. And the truth is that today people differ on almost any single ethical, moral question in the world. We don't have absolute clarity where every human being would see the same issue in the same categories of true and false. And therefore, I believe what Maimonides would say is that after human beings lost that clarity, we need to have God declare definitively issues of morality. And therefore, what happens is after revelation, after the Torah is revealed, morality becomes essential. It's not just conventional anymore because the author of thou shalt not kill is the same author of let there be light. What happens with revealed morality is that the author of reality is the author of morality. And therefore, morality is built into the fabric of reality. It's no longer a function of what we feel or social convention. Things become intrinsically, cosmically right or wrong. And that's why in order to have an effective and proper relationship with other people, we have to figure God into the equation. And finally, one last thing I'll just throw out quickly now, we'll get back to this, in terms of the impact of spirituality on our interpersonal relationships. What we're going to see is that when it comes to the ritual laws of Judaism, the laws where we think there can't be any connection between the ritual laws of Judaism and the interpersonal realm, what we'll see is that all of the ritual laws of Judaism impact our inner lives and our interpersonal lives. <clears throat> now the Torah and the teachings of Judaism place a huge emphasis on, interpers on the interpersonal realm. I'll just share a few examples to, to, to prove this. We know we discussed previously that Abraham was chosen to be the progenitor of the nation of Israel. But why was Abraham chosen? Why did God choose him? So we find in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God explicitly spells it out. God says, I have loved him because he commands his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of God doing righteousness, charity, and justice. That's why Abraham was chosen. Number two, in the Ten Commandments, which everyone assumes is the bedrock of Judaism, well, you have two sides to the Ten Commandments. The first five, at least four of the five, seem to deal with the human-divine relationship, but the last five or six deal with the relationship between people. Number three, I think I've mentioned this, in the Talmud is a famous story where someone comes to Hillel, the great sage, and asks Hillel to teach him the entire Torah while he stands on one foot. He says, I want to convert to Judaism. I don't have a lot of time, so give me the whole story while I stand on one foot, which basically is insulting. He's saying, tell me the whole, everything you know in five seconds. So Hillel says to him, fine. He says, what is hateful to you, don't do to your friend. If it really would bother you, don't do it to someone else. And then Hillel goes on to say, the rest of the Torah, everything else is a commentary to that. Now go and learn it. But you see that Hillel here seems to reduce distill Judaism into this principle of interpersonal relationships. Number four, Rabbi Akiva, another great, great sage of Judaism, quotes the verse in Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor, your friend, as yourself. And he says this is the great principle of the Torah. Number five, on Yom Kippur, our holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, we spend much of the day confessing all the things we did that were wrong. It's customary to have in the prayer book a long list of transgressions. We bend over and we strike ourselves on the heart 
and you go through this long list of transgressions, you'll see the vast majority of them are not discussing our transgressions against God, but rather our transgressions against other people. Number six, Maimonides himself writes in his Laws of the Sabbath, chapter 2, paragraph 7, he writes the following, the purpose of the laws of the Torah are to bring mercy, loving kindness, and peace upon the world. And finally, number seven, in the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Makot, pages 23b to 24a, they have a number of different attempts to distill the 613 commandments into their essence. Let me share with you some of these reductions. David came, King David, and he summed up the 613 commandments in 11 principles. And he bases these 11 principles on what he wrote in the book of Psalms, chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. He says, what does the 613 commandments distill down into? He says, Lord, who may sojourn in your tent and who may dwell on your holy mountain? God, who can have a relationship with you? He says, number one, one who lives without blame. Number two, he who does righteous acts. Number three, he who speaks the truth in his heart. Number four, he whose tongue speaks no deceit. Number five, he who has not done harm to his fellow. Number six, he who has borne reproach for his acts toward his neighbor. Number seven, he for whom a contemptible person is abhorrent. Number eight, he who honors those who are in awe of God. Number nine, he who stands by his oath even when it's to his disadvantage. Number 10, he who has never lent money for interest. And number 11, he who has accepted, never accepted a bribe against the innocent. Well, the way King David seems to be distilling all of the Torah is in basically interpersonal ethical uh, c concepts. Then Isaiah came. And he summed up the 630 commandments in six principles based upon Isaiah chapter 33, verses 15 to 16. Number one, the Torah is based upon walking in righteousness. Number two, speaking honestly. Number three, spurning profit from a fraudulent dealing. Number four, waving away a bribe instead of taking it. Number five, he who closes his ears and doesn't listen to malicious words. Number six, he who shuts his eyes against looking at evil. Again, it's focusing on the interpersonal realm. And then the prophet Micha came, and he summed up the entire Torah in three principles. This is Micha chapter 6, verse 8. God has told you, O man, what is good, and what does God require of you only? To do justice, to love goodness, and to walk humbly and modestly with your God. Isaiah comes back with a second distillation, and he says, based upon chapter 56, verse 1, all of the 613 commandments can be summed up in two principles. Number one, do justice. Number two, carry out acts of righteousness and charity. And finally, Habakkuk came, and he summed up the 613 commandments in one principle. And he said in his book, chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous shall live according to their faith. What he's saying is, for the righteous person who is righteous in the eyes of God, everything they do vis-a-vis -vis the world, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the natural world or their own personal life or their interpersonal relationships, is all done based upon their faith in God. <clears throat> now, the teachings of Judaism relating to interpersonal ethics are vast. It would be <laughs> a little bit too ambitious to assume we can cover all of it tonight. What I'd like to do is look at the interpersonal realm through the lens of a verse in the book of Psalms, chapter 34, verse 15, where King David says, first, sur me ra, turn away from doing evil, and then he says, ase tov, and do good. These are the two planes I would like to look at. The first level, as in the field of medicine, is what we say, do no harm. The first level of interpersonal ethics and excellence is first, don't do any harm. Don't hurt other people. However, it needs to be said that the definition of a good person is certainly not simply someone who doesn't hurt others. That's not a good person. 
That simply means that the person isn't a criminal. If you don't hurt other people, you're not a criminal. It doesn't make you yet a good person until you go to the next level and actually do good. So let's begin now by exploring some of the Torah's teachings in the realm of not harming others, turning away from evil. So the first thing I'd like to discuss is the Torah's prohibition and warning that we should never cause any damage to people or their property. The simplest level, don't hurt people or their property. And this would include doing anything that creates a dangerous situation. The Talmud goes through many, many examples of what it might mean to act irresponsibly. But for example, it means not leaving something on the ground that might cause other people to trip. That would be evil. Because even though you haven't actually necessarily hurt someone, you've done something irresponsible that might lead to someone being hurt or their property being hurt. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, great sage, was once talking to another rabbi, and he noticed that the rabbi had his umbrella and it was pointing down diagonally. He wasn't holding the umbrella vertically. And he criticized the other rabbi. He says, what are you holding your umbrella like that for? You know, someone might trip. So the person who is ethical lives their life concerned about possibly causing any damage or harm to other people. One of my pet peeves, I'm still threatening to write a book about this, is the way people behave in cars. I think that people often think that they're in a world by themselves in a car and that nothing really uh, is real. They can do whatever they want. But you'll notice that in many parking lots, so they have places that are designated as parking spots, and then they have places that are clearly not parking spots, like, for example, in the lane that goes between two lanes of cars. But then they have areas delineated specifically not as a parking spot, meaning you might think you could park there, but they're telling you with these lines that go in a diagonal, you're not supposed to park here. Yet what do people do? They park there. Now, I would say that according to Torah teaching, that's wrong for many reasons. But one of the reasons is very simple. When you park in an area not designated for parking, you are making it more difficult for other cars to maneuver and for other cars to get by. And that might lead them to become late to their destination. They may have to go a little bit slower, even by a minute. And that's not right. You're slowing someone down because you don't want to walk another 30 feet to go park in a real parking spot. Or because people have to drive out of their way to get around your car, you might end up scaring a pedestrian that's walking in the parking lot. So the idea of being concerned not just about not harming people or their property, but not even coming close to doing something that might have the possibility of harming other people. Now, one of the amazing things about Jewish life is that from a very young age, students in a Jewish school, we call it a yeshiva, they study Talmud, usually starting, that depends on the school, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 12, 13. One of the subjects that's traditionally studied by children at a very early age for years are the laws of damages. And students are learning, what happens if I dig a pit in the ground and your animal falls into the pit? And they learn that it's not just literally a pit. It's anything that you do that might cause damage to someone. So here what you're seeing is young children from a very young age are spending hours and hours and hours a day, five or six days a week, studying the laws of torts, of damages. And it helps sensitize them to how wrong and inappropriate this kind of behavior is. <clears throat> a second area of what we shouldn't be doing. The Torah says, don't steal or take anything that doesn't belong to you. Now that sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not as simple as that. For example, the Torah prohibits taking any amount, any amount that doesn't belong to you. It could be taking a pen from your place of work. It could be taking some soap from the hotel you're staying in. It could be sampling some food in the supermarket. 
And it seems trivial. It might seem, what's the big deal? They're not going to miss it. But the Midrash says that the world was destroyed with the flood in the times of Noah because people stole less than a pruta. Pruta was the smallest coin that they had. And it probably was that if you stole that kind of an amount, you could not really be prosecuted in court. So people might have thought that, okay, I can steal that much and I won't go to court. But what happens is it becomes part of normal life to steal small amounts. And when that becomes built into the fabric of society, society basically will not be able to exist. When dishonesty becomes accepted on any level, it's a tremendous problem. Another area is that an employee must put in a full day's work. For example, they're not allowed to stay up all night partying or doing whatever the night before they go to work and come into work very hard and not be able to work properly. Or they're not allowed to waste time at work. You know, there was a study done recently on how much time employees at work play computer games at work. It's pretty scary. So the person that's specially working per hour is being paid per hour. If they're being paid eight hours of work, they have to put in eight hours of work. And if they steal five minutes of that time, it's stealing from their employer. We're also prohibited from wasting the time of other people. For example, coming late to a meeting. That's considered stealing. Or what we call in Hebrew, gezel sheina, stealing someone's sleep. If you're living in an apartment building and you make a lot of noise late at night or early in the morning, or you call people at a ridiculously early or late hour, that's considered stealing. You're stealing your sleep. I had a very strange story happen to me in Australia many years ago. I was speaking at a university in Sydney, and I was billeted in a home where something very strange happened. I, I went to bed late. Before I went to bed, everyone was asleep already. I went to the laboratory, the washroom, and I tried to get out, and I was locked in. It never had to happen before. Locked in the bathroom. What am I going to do? Everybody's asleep. I can't wake anyone up. Thank God they had a Newsweek magazine in there. And I was in the bathroom from, eight, from 12 at night till 8 in the morning. But it's prohibited to wake people up. Unless, of course, it's an emergency and someone's life's at stake. But I wasn't going to die from being in the bathroom for eight hours. Another area which is very, very, very significant is what we call in Hebrew, geneva da'at, stealing someone's mind, deceiving others, misleading other people. For example, if you're selling a product, concealing the defects in the product that you're selling, putting all the strawberries that are good looking on top, the lousy ones are on the bottom where you can't see them, or creating a false impression so people will think highly of you or have gratitude that's not rightfully yours. The Talmud speaks about not urging someone to come and be your guest or to come and eat with you if you know in advance that they won't or they can't come anyway. So you know that they really can't come and you're extending this generous invitation. Big shot. What kind of a generous invitation it is? It's nothing. You know they can't come anyway. That's creating a false impression. You're stealing the person's gratitude because they're going to feel gratitude to you for inviting them, making a generous invitation. Or, here's one that's going to come up very soon for many Jewish families. Passover is coming soon. People who observe Passover can't have leavened products in their house. Let's say you have a cake that you didn't eat, a big, beautiful, frozen cake that's in your freezer. You can't keep the cake. We're not allowed to have in our homes leavened products. So let's say you have a big box of beautiful pasta. So what do I do? I have my next door neighbors right on the street here. They're Italian, beautiful people. Before Passover, I come and I give them all my leavened products. But if you do that without explaining to them that it's a religious obligation for you to get rid of your chametz, of your leavened products, you're creating the impression that you're just a nice guy. So you're not allowed to give them all of these things without explaining to them why you're giving it to them. Another form of deception is giving misleading advice. I just read a fascinating story about the cultures in different countries that film the, I don't even know if the show is on anymore, but who wants to be a millionaire? 
And one of the things that the contestant can do if they don't know the answer, they could either call a friend somewhere else as a lifeline or they can poll the audience. They found that in the former Soviet Union, the audience members would often give people the wrong answer. It's very interesting. Here in North America, the audience, generally speaking, they will give the right answer. But for some reason, which I can direct you to the reason why they might do this, in the former Soviet Union, it was very common for the audience members to mislead the contestant with the wrong answer. There was a famous story in France, where in France, it's not normally done to mislead people, but there was a contestant who got the first four answers correctly, and then the fifth question, which was the easiest question in the world, the person didn't know. And he polled the audience, and the audience basically all gave the wrong answer because they felt it was not right, it wasn't fair for such a dumbbell to proceed with, the, with, this, with this contest. So they gave him the wrong answer on purpose. But when you give people the wrong advice or wrong information, that's also a form of deception. Another area is acknowledging when you don't know something rather than bluffing or switching the topic or something I would do in university essay tests, I would answer a similar question correctly. So the Talmud says you should train your tongue to say, I don't know rather than pretending to know something. And finally, the Talmud says in Tractate Baba Metziah, chapter 4, Mishnah 10, it's prohibited to ask the price of an item in a store that you have no intention of buying. Let's say, for example, you're out on the street and it starts to pour and rain and you run into an electronic store. You are not shopping for a new cell phone. You've got one. You just bought... Your, uh, uh, your phone a year before this. But you start looking at all the phones and asking how much does this one cost? The Talmud says it's absolutely prohibited to ask for the price of something if you're not actually shopping. Or it might be that you are shopping, but you've decided to purchase something online, but you want to see what it looks like. So you go into a store and pretend to be a customer. The Talmud says absolutely forbidden for two reasons. Number one, you're misleading the salespeople and giving them false hope. They may make their money on commission and they might think you're a potential customer. And number two, you're wasting their time because they could be talking to a real customer. A third area of things that we're not supposed to do is as the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, we're not supposed to take revenge and we're not supposed to hold a grudge. Now, what does it mean to take revenge, what does it mean to hold a grudge? So the Talmud in Tractate Yuma, page 23a, gives a very simple definition of both of these prohibitions. What does it mean to take revenge? The Talmud says, you go to your neighbor and you say, can I please borrow your lawnmower? And your neighbor says, no, you can't borrow my lawnmower. A week later, your neighbor comes to you and says, can I borrow your leaf blower? And you say, no, you wouldn't lend me your lawnmower. I'm not going to lend you my leaf blower. That's considered taking revenge. What does it mean to hold a grudge? So in holding a grudge, the case is that your neighbor comes to you and says, can I borrow your lawnmower? And you say, no, you can't borrow my lawnmower. A week later, you go to your neighbor and say, can I borrow your leaf blower? And your neighbor says, sure, here's the leaf blower. I'm not like you. You wouldn't lend me your lawnmower, but I'm going to let you have my leaf blower. That's called bearing a grudge. Now, what is the proper response? What should a person actually say? So the Torah teaches us in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, don't hate your brother in your heart, but you shall surely reprove or rebuke your neighbor and don't bear sin because of him. What the Torah is teaching us is that we should call people on their poor behavior, but do it in a way where you don't yourself sin in the process. So for example, don't call them on it in a way that humiliates them or embarrasses them. As a matter of fact, the Talmud says if you embarrass someone in public, it's like you murdered them. So what might be appropriate? You might say to them when they come asking for your leaf blower, sure, here's the leaf blower. I'm just curious about why you didn't lend me your lawnmower last week. 
And what you're doing by presenting it as a question is similar to what God did in the beginning of the Bible. After Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they went to hide, and God just asks an open-ended question, where are you? And later, when Cain kills his brother, God confronts Cain and just simply says, where is Abel, your brother? But what God is doing in both cases is giving people a chance to reflect on what they've done and possibly engage in a discussion. One of the most serious things the Bible warns us against doing is harmful speech. In Hebrew, it's called Lashon Hara, literally evil tongue. All societies, every society in the world has laws against untrue slander. If I say something about you that is slanderous, that will harm you, that's not true, I can be taken to court and sued. But the Torah doesn't only prohibit untrue negative language. The Torah prohibits even true statements that are derogatory, demeaning, will hurt or diminish or embarrass other people. For example, I say, you know, Sue is a great mom and keeps a beautiful home, but you know, she rarely has any guests. Totally prohibited. Or, I, I remark about one of my coworkers. You know, Joe is not a very talented person. But we all know that he got his job through his connections. So any statement like that, which might be true, but which is damaging to someone's reputation or might hurt their feelings, is totally prohibited. Even hinting is prohibited and inappropriate. For example, if I were to say, you know, it's a messy story about Barbara. I don't want to get into it. Or someone says to you, you know, Rabbi Goldberg gave a great talk this weekend. And you say sarcastically, yeah, right. Or you roll your eyes. Totally prohibited, even though you never said a word. There's a wonderful story, a study that was done. I really recommend this book. It's called Swayed, or Sway, I think. And they have a, a study that was done at a university where there was a large class that was going to have a substitute teacher. Someone was going to come in and take the place of the regular teacher. Half the students were given a biography, a CV of this substitute teacher, and the other half was given the exact same CV, biography, except one word was different. So both of, the, both of the stories about this teacher that was coming in spoke about their education and what they've written. But one of them said that this uh, teacher is considered to be cold and serious. And the other one said basically that this teacher is really considered to be a warm person and very serious. So you had a whole paragraph describing this teacher, very, very exact same description except one word difference. And what was fascinating about this study was, after the teacher left, the students were asked to rate this teacher in terms of many different uh, characteristics. Were they a good communicator? Were they fair? Uh, were, they, were, were they an interesting teacher? And there were about a, a dozen things they had to rate the teacher on. And what was amazing was, that the students who were given the negative evaluation, even though all the students were in the same class with the same teacher, the students who received the negative, quote unquote, because of that one word, biography or CV, rated this teacher horribly when they were asked to give their feedback. The students who were given the more positive CV had a glowing report about this teacher. Even though he was teaching the exact same students, exact same teachings, but they were predisposed towards looking at this person because of the report that they were given. What we see from this is that evil speech can ruin reputations, ruin careers, ruin relationships, and we know ruin lives. We've seen many cases recently of people that were publicly shamed, especially on the internet, who went and committed suicide. So we're not talking about something that is harmless. 
In Jewish literature, evil speech is seen as particularly pernicious and is considered on par with the cardinal sins of idolatry, adultery, and murder. The Talmud says that evil speech harms three people, the one that says it, the one that it's said about, and the one that's listening to it. And we know that it's almost impossible to make amends for evil speech. There was a famous story where someone was very, very uh, broken, and they were very uh, re regretful. They had tremendous remorse about the fact that they had spoken negative, negatively about someone. And they went to the rabbi and said, what can I do? Now, there's a whole question of whether it makes any sense to tell the person that you spoke about and to ask them for forgiveness because maybe it's better they don't know you spoke about them. But the rabbi said, if you want to make up for what you did, I want you to bring a big feather pillow to the top of the mountain tomorrow and meet me there. And the person wondered, why are we going to do that? And the rabbi said the next day, here's a knife, I want you to slice open this feather pillow and shake it. And the feathers were blown all over the countryside. And then the rabbi said, try picking them up. And the problem is that when we say anything about someone, we have no way of taking it back. We don't know how far it's going to go. We don't know who it's going to be repeated to, especially, again, in our days with the virtual world we live in, where one word that's spoken or written here in Toronto can end up in New Zealand within three seconds. Evil speech or negative reports are only permitted if there is an immediate, practical, important need. Then it's permissible. For example, if you're checking references for hiring someone or for a match, uh, you, you were set up with someone to go out on a date, someone that you're thinking of marrying, so you're allowed to call up their references, to call up a potential person you're going to hire for a job and check their references. You're not required to take the person sight unseen. So you can call their previous employer and say, how did this person perform at the job? Now, there are tremendous restrictions in terms of what the person is allowed to tell you. They can only tell you what is absolutely necessary without exaggerating, without any intention of harming the person's reputation. But that's the only exception to the rule of not speaking negatively with one interesting caveat that you're allowed to ask for such a report and the person can relay such information, but you're not allowed to believe it. I mean, there's three problems, speaking evil speech, listening to it, and believing it. So what is the implication of not believing it? It's very simple. If someone else comes to you and asks you that they're interested in hiring Joe, what can you tell me? You can't tell them anything. Because you're not allowed to believe what that other person told you. You were able to listen to the report from the previous employer, but you didn't get it from two witnesses. You're not allowed to accept it as absolutely true to the degree that you're allowed to relay it to a third party. Now, in the time that we have remaining, let's try to briefly look at some of the Torah's teachings on what is considered virtuous behavior. We did a little bit about what we shouldn't do. Now let's look at the Torah, what it says in terms of what we should do. Before we do this, though, I want to look at an important prerequisite. Remember that Hillel summarized Judaism by saying that if something would annoy you, you shouldn't do it to someone else. This principle is premised on the idea that we're going to think about how our behavior impacts other people. The problem is that each one of us is acutely aware of how we feel. If I'm standing next to you, I'm acutely aware if you're standing too close to me. If you're in my space, I don't feel right. And if you're doing something that bothers me, I feel it very, very acutely. But we don't feel the same way about how our actions impact others. We're not automatically sensitive to how our actions impact other people. So the question is, how does the Torah prompt us to think about others? So I want to share with you three thoughts. Number one comes from a wonderful Jewish philosopher, Eliezer Berkowitz. Now, in a very long article that really shares much more than I'm going to be sharing, he says the following, and this takes us back to what I mentioned earlier tonight, how the ritual laws impact our interpersonal relationships. He says that 
when you want to train people to do something, you can't just lecture them. For example, if you want to teach someone how to swim, you can't give them a lecture with a blackboard. They have to go into the water. And if you want to train soldiers, you can't give them lectures. They have to actually fight. And what happens to train soldiers is you can't throw them into a battle, into a real war situation. You're going to lose half your army. So we have something called war games where they act as if the fighting was real. They put little sticks on their helmets and they crawl. The bullets coming are not real. But they play war games to fight as if it was a real war experience. The way we learn things is by actually doing them. So the way we learn, for example, self-control is not by going to a lecture about self-control. It's about learning it by controlling ourselves. So Roy Berkowitz says that we as Jews grow up where from a very young age we are thrown into a world of ritual. Hundreds of rituals. Two, for example, and especially how these impact children. Jews have rituals and elaborate laws about what we're allowed to eat and not allowed to eat and when we're allowed to eat it. Someone once said very wisely, it's not a bad thing for children to learn they can't eat every candy in the store. So what happens is young Jewish people growing up are learning from a young age that before they eat food, they have to check to see if it's kosher. Or if they just had a meal with meat, they have to wait a certain amount of time before they drink milk. There's a whole world of kashrut, of dietary laws, which again, it's not once a year or twice a year. It's every single day for the whole day. Kids are always thinking about eating. So this is a ritual that impacts kids all the time. Or Shabbat, once a week, where there are many things that the children are told they're not allowed to do. Now the truth is, Berkowitz says, that nothing is really going to happen to the kid, or to even adults, nothing's going to happen on the spot at least, that we can see that is a reaction to we do the wrong thing. Meaning that if the kid goes to the store and buys non-kosher candy, his tongue's not going to fall out. There's no immediate obvious kind of impact. So he says that we go through our lives as if it really did make an impact. Spiritually, it obviously does. So what is the payoff? Two things. Number one, we're not normally attuned to how other people feel. But growing up in a Jewish life, we from a very, very young age become trained to always be thinking about how an other feels. And the other is God. What does God say about eating this? What does God say about doing this on Shabbat? It's said in many other laws. So what happens is Jewish kids, from the time they're very, very young, are trained not to only be considerate and thinking of and sensitive to their agenda. They're trained from a very young age to think about what does God feel? And so the ability for them to get beyond themselves and think about how their behavior impacts other people is facilitated. Secondly, in order to behave properly, it often requires the exercise of tremendous self-control. So when do people learn to exercise self-control? In a crisis situation? When it's really tempting to do the wrong thing? Or for those years and years and years before there was a crisis and they had to control themselves in terms of what they were going to eat and when they were going to eat? So they've already built up a tremendous reservoir of self-discipline. A second way in which the Torah helps us think about others is by the many laws and rituals which teach us empathy for inanimate objects. Now this sounds like science fiction or strangeness. What does it mean to have empathy for inanimate objects? And yet Torah law constantly does it. I'll just give two examples. We know that every meal normally that we eat starts with bread. Meals begin with bread. Yet on the Sabbath and on a holiday, the meal does not begin with bread. The meal begins with a cup of wine. So the custom is, in Jewish families, 
that the bread is sitting there on the table, and yet we're going to pass over it and begin the meal with wine. So in order that the bread shouldn't be embarrassed, the custom is we cover the bread. So children are taught from a young age, you know what, we don't want to embarrass the bread, so we cover the bread because we're passing over the bread. Now, there's a lesson here. If we're being urged to be considerate of the feeling of something which doesn't have feelings, an inanimate object, then obviously, and all the more so, we should have consideration and empathy for people that do have feelings. Or another example. The Torah tells us to wear tzitzit, these strings, which remind us of the 613 commandments. So the custom is that if we ever go to a cemetery, we're supposed to take these strings and tuck them into our pants, not let them be exposed. Why? So the Torah says, because to flaunt the commandments that you're able to do is rubbing it into the noses of the people that are dead. They can't observe commandments. And the Talmud calls it loeg l'rash. You're mocking the poor. Now again, the person is dead. They don't know what's going on. And yet we relate to them as if they had feelings. So there are many, many rituals where we are led to treat the inanimate objects as if they had feelings and to be considerate of those feelings, again, as a way of helping us to become sensitive to the feelings of other people. And finally, one last technique, which again, this is not exhaust all their techniques, but the Torah constantly reminds us to remember that we were slaves in Egypt and we were oppressed in Egypt. And the reason the Torah is constantly reminding us to remember that we were slaves in Egypt, and the Torah says, never forget how you suffered in Egypt, and therefore, since you know how it feels, you should never do it to someone else. You know what it's like to be oppressed. You should never, God forbid, oppress others. <clears throat> the major directive in forming the Torah's positive aspects of our interpersonal relationships is love of the other, to love others and to treat them with kindness. Of course, it's not so simple for the Torah to command an emotion. What does it mean that the Torah says to love other people? What is primarily meant when the Torah says to love others is to treat them as if we love them. Meaning, treat people with kindness, with respect, with generosity, and with patience. Treat them in a way as if you love them. And this will ultimately lead to cultivating feelings of love. This is how human beings are wired. The word in Hebrew for love is ahava. Ahava. And ahava has as its root hav. Have in Hebrew means to give. And so what we're being taught is that not only do we give to those who we love, but we begin to love those who we give to. Our inner state is impacted by our external actions. Our inner state is impacted by what we do. You know, when if you ever volunteer for UJA Federation, for their telethon, making phone calls, there's always big signs on the wall that say, smile as you dial. Because if you're smiling, believe it or not, you will come across at the person at the other end of the line, they can't even see you. You'll sound happier, friendlier, and we all know this, that if you're feeling tired, sit up straight. If you're feeling any way that you want to cultivate an inner feeling, you can begin to change that by changing your outer actions. So let's discuss some of the Torah's teachings on giving. The Torah teaches in chapter 19, verse 15 of Leviticus, B'tzedek tishpot et amitecha. You should judge people with righteousness, i.e. you should judge people generously. The way this is expressed in Ethics of the Fathers in the Talmud is heve dan et kol adam lekaf schut, give every person the benefit of the doubt. And if it's tremendously probable that the person is wrong, there's not much of a doubt, 
you should at least have the matter undecided in your mind. But in general, what the Torah is saying is we should try to give others the benefit of the doubt. You know what? We are all geniuses. We're all very adept at judging ourselves favorably, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, finding explanations for our bad behavior, making excuses for ourselves. We're very good at doing that. The Torah asks us to do the same for others, to try to find extenuating circumstances for their behavior and not to jump to conclusions prematurely about what happens. I'll recommend two wonderful books. One is called Courtrooms of the Mind by Rabbi Hanoch Teller. Another is called The Other Side of the Story by Yehudis Samet. She's part of a group in Jerusalem of women that would meet every week and they would present to the group situations in their lives where people that they knew hurt them, let them down, disappointed them. I didn't get invited to this person's wedding or this person returned my, returned my crock pot and it wasn't clean. Every day, especially with those closest to us, we are disappointed, we're upset, we're hurt, and we tend to judge negatively. And so what they did in this group was they would brainstorm, how could you have judged the person favorably? And it's a book which she recounts many teachings on the topic of judging people favorably. She reviews many of the stories that they discussed in their group. I recommend the book highly. In Pirkei Avot, again from the Talmud Ethics of the Fathers, chapter 2, paragraph 5, the Mishnah says, don't judge your friend till you stand in their place. Don't judge others till you're in their situation. The truth is, we are never in someone else's place. We never know totally what's going on in someone else's life. We don't know about what kind of health issues they're facing. We don't know about the difficulties they're going through at work or at their home. We don't know about whether they had a death of a friend or a family member. We don't know about their financial problems. We don't know about their stress. We don't know what people are going through, and therefore we shouldn't judge them. One of the greatest elixirs in life, if you want a recipe for dramatically improving your interpersonal relationships, use this technique of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Finally, on a spiritual side, we're taught that God judges us in the same way we judge other people. So if we are generous and kind in the way we judge other people, that's the way God will judge us. Moving on, the Torah's main teaching is that we should treat others with chesed, with kindness and with loving kindness. One of the quintessential character traits that the Torah seeks to instill in us is to be kind to others and extend kindness to others. This includes hospitality, welcoming guests into your home. If you read chapter Genesis, Genesis chapter 18, uh, Abraham, who was just circumcised three days before, is running around like a maniac to welcome guests into his home. He's upset that no one has come to visit him. God finally sends three visitors in the heat of the day. But welcoming guests into our homes is a quintessential Jewish activity. I know many, many, many Jewish people that for them, their Shabbat table is empty unless they have guests. The Torah uh, directs us to visit the sick. People are not well to visit them, to comfort people that are mourners, to rejoice in the success and good fortune of others. Sometimes hard to do that. To bring joy to a bride and groom. You know, the one major difference between a Jewish wedding and a non-Jewish wedding, at a non-Jewish wedding, people are there to have a good time. They dance with their spouse. At a Jewish wedding, you're not there to have a good time. You're there to make a good time for the bride and groom. So everyone at the wedding is there to celebrate for, to make the bride and groom feel good, not for themselves to have a great time. And finally, again, it's in a long list, but making peace between quarreling people Bringing people who are quarreling to peace is a very, very critical idea. One of the central areas of extending loving kindness to others is the institution of staka, sometimes translated as charity, but more correctly translated as righteousness. The norm is to give a minimum of 10% to others, to charitable causes. That means after taxes, not 10% of the gross, but 10% of the net after taxes. The recommendation is you don't give more than 20% because you yourself should not become impoverished. 
But some people do give more than 20%. It should be the worst thing they do. Uh, and it's not just giving people money, but encouragement, moral support, advice, any way that we're helpful is a way of giving charity. Maimonides speaks about eight levels of charity, eight levels of giving tzedakah, from the lowest to the highest. The lowest level is to give grudgingly. The next lowest level is to give less than you should give, but to give it cheerfully. The next level up is giving directly to the poor when you're asked. The next level up is giving to the poor without being asked. The next level up is giving indirectly where the recipient knows the giver, but the giver doesn't know the recipient. The next level up is where the giver knows the recipient, but the recipient doesn't know the giver. The next level up is where the recipient doesn't know the giver, and the giver doesn't know the recipient. For example, if you give money to a general charity fund in the city, that's the seventh level of giving charity. And the eighth level, the highest level, is helping a person get a job, taking them as a business partner, giving them a loan so they can get on their feet. Anything that you could do to make them independent where they won't have to ask for charity. Obviously, what is central in the ethic here is giving in a way where you give sensitively and you respect the dignity of the recipient. I want to share two final thoughts before we take questions. One very, very central idea in the Talmud is that even though the Torah has many laws, we are encouraged to always go beyond the letter of the law. The Talmud says in uh, Tractate Baba Metzia that the temple was only destroyed there are actually many reasons the Talmud gives to why the temple was destroyed. But one of the reasons the Talmud gives is because the Jewish people at that time followed the Torah. That seems counterintuitive. I mean, the, Torah, the temple was destroyed because the Jewish people followed the Torah. The Talmud says, I thought that's a good thing. So the Talmud says, yes, they followed the law, but they didn't go beyond the letter of the law. Now, what does that mean? Think of it this way. If you get married... And on the first day of your wedding, after your wedding, you say to your spouse, you know, dear, I love you very much, and I'm willing to fulfill all of the terms in the marriage document. But don't even dream about asking me to do anything that's not written down in the marriage document. That's a recipe for a disastrous marriage. Or you come into the first day at work, and you tell the boss, you know, I really am happy I have this job. I just want to let you know, sir, that... I am only willing to do what's exactly spelled out in my job description. Don't even dream about asking me to come in one minute earlier than 9 o'clock in the morning. Don't even dream about asking me to stay here one minute after 5 o'clock. Don't even dream about asking me to do anything that's not specified and delineated in my job description. That's not going to work out. So the Talmud says if our attitude is, I'm only going to do exactly what's required, that's a recipe for disaster. We have to try to understand what is it that God really wants? What is God's ultimate agenda? What the Torah really pres prescribes or, or teaches is a minimum, is a minimum, is the bottom line. But a person shouldn't go through life saying, yes, my whole life I'm going to do exactly what the minimum is. I want to squeak by. The attitude should be, I really want to do the right thing. And the right thing is often going beyond the letter of the law. Let me give one example. One of the major ethical concerns in Judaism, and this goes back to the first class we had, is sanctifying the name of God. The role of the Jewish people in this world is to help the rest of the world come to know God. So as Jews, one of our major ethical obligations is what we call in Hebrew, Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify the name of God. We represent God in the world. We are responsible for being his ambassadors in the world. And this awareness is especially critical when it comes to our interaction with non-Jews. There's a famous story in the Talmud where Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach purchased a camel from an Arab. And when he brought the camel back to his home, he went through the saddlebag and he saw there was a very precious jewel in the saddlebag. Now the law would say, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. He sold me the camel and everything in it. You know, if you buy a car from someone and they didn't check the glove compartment and there's a, 
you know, a, a Rolex watch in the glove compartment, it's your Rolex, technically speaking. But Shimon ben Shetach said, even though that's the law, that's not what I'm called upon to do. So he returned the camel to this Arab. He said, look, you probably weren't aware that in the saddlebag was this very precious jewel. And the Arab says, blessed be the God of the Jewish people. So these are two meta ideas that are supposed to inform all of our interactions. Number one, going beyond the letter of the law. And number two, living with an awareness that we have a responsibility to sanctify the name of God.